Good morning, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, I call this hearing to order. Today, we are here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Clean Water Act. Let me begin by asking unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare a recess at any time during today's hearing without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions. And without objection, so ordered. As a reminder, please keep your microphone muted unless speaking. Should I hear any inadvertent noise, I will request that the member please mute their microphone. And finally, to insert a documented record, please have your staff mail it to documents ti at mail.house.gov. Uh, today, the committee will receive testimony from a number of perspectives on the Clean Water Act and its impacts over the last 50 years. When Congress enacted this law in 1972, it recognized that the nation's waterways were in crisis and for too long, we had neglected our moral and financial responsibility to keep our waterways clean and safe. In 1972, only one third of the nation's water met quality, water quality goals. And through the investments in clean water infrastructure, such as the historic clean water funding in bipartisan infrastructure law and the rigorous science-based water quality protection, we have made significant improvements. However, the job is not done. Today, 50 years later, we have failed to achieve the X goal of making the waters, all waters, both fishable and swimmable, with one third of our waters remaining impaired. Failing to meet these quality standard goals does not mean that the act has been a failure, far from it. New investments in the water treatment and enforcing water quality standards mean that more and more waterways will continue to improve. For example, thanks to the federal clean water investments and local support, local water bodies, such as the Anacostia River in the nation's capital, once described as the most polluted river in the United States, may be swimmable and fishable within the next few years. In California, I have supported the San Gabriel River revitalization plan and improvements to the San Gabriel River. Because of the collaborative work between locals, the state of California and the federal government, we have affirmed the Los Angeles River as protected. Never go waterway under the Clean Water Act over a decade ago. Work continues on environmental restoration of the Los Angeles River. Many of today's witnesses have years of experience in working to protect waterways and provide for public health and safety. We will hear how they work both at the state level as well as locally to meet the goals and objections. Objections of the Clean Water Act to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's water. Under the Clean Water Act, the states play a critical role in co-administering the law and taking a lead role in protecting both locally and important waters, as well as the health of upstream and downstream waters from neighboring states. This federal and state partnership has been a success for the last 50 years, and it also has been the foundation to the improvements in our nation's water quality. States also play a critical role in managing the Clean Water Act state revolving funds that provide investments for the construction of water treatment projects. From 1972 to the present, the federal government has invested over 100 billion in construction of sewage treatment plants, both in grants and through the Clean Water SRF program. When the Clean Water Act was enacted, these clean water infrastructure investments were largely, were the largest non-military public works programs in the interstate highway system. Yet, because the investments are often out of sight and therefore out of mind, we often forget about the water infrastructure investments until there's a problem or crisis, such as we recently seen in Jackson, Mississippi. Earlier this year, Congress passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which provided an additional $11.7 billion over the next five years for the Clean Water SRF, as well as an additional $1 billion specifically to address emerging contaminants. These investments make a big difference in cleaning up waterways and for public safety, as well as, as uh, anything else that comes along. 
Uh, we will hear testimony today on their impact. We'll also hear about the important work of ensuring that all communities, including tribal nations, benefit from the protections of the Clean Water Act. For too much of our nation's history, disadvantaged communities are the front lines of pollution and contamination. Environmental just can take many forms and many, and impacts many different com uh, communities. Today also marks a reflection point of the importance of the Federal Partnership and Leadership Act in protecting our nation's health, its economy, and the health of a water-based environment. In the past two years, the Biden administration has taken steady, scientifically based actions to restore the bedrock environment laws that protect our water, our air, our environment, and our health. And as I've said numerous times before, the previous administration ignored the bipartisan traditions of presidents dating back to President Ronald Reagan in seeking to roll back Clean Water Act protections. Fortunately, most of his decisions were quickly overturned by federal courts as fundamentally flawed or in violation of federal law, and those that were not are being revisited by the current administration. However, when the past few years have shown is, is that the leadership matters, the successes we have fought for over the past 50 years need to be constantly protected and extended. That is the text for the next 50 years. I want to welcome all our witnesses here this morning and I am grateful for your willingness to share your views and your perspectives on the last 50 years of the Clean Water Act. I now yield to my great partner and great ranking member, Mr. Rouse, for any comments and thoughts you might have on the matter. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Napolitano, and I appreciate uh, your holding this hearing uh, today. I'd also like to thank our witnesses uh, for being with us uh, today. Uh, in 1972, as has been stated, and we all know Congress passed uh, the Clean Water Act in an overwhelmingly bipartisan fashion. Uh, members on both sides of the aisle recognized we had a major problem with water quality in our nation's waters and understood the many benefits that we derive from access to clean, navigable waters. North Carolina's 7th Congressional District, which I'm honored to represent, in fact, is known for beautiful waterways and beaches that provide significant recreational and economic benefits. We also have many important water bodies that we rely on for commerce and drinking water. The Clean Water Act has had great success in its 50 years protecting these waters in North Carolina and all around the country. However, we've yet to reach the ambitious goal Congress set out in 1972 to make all waters in the United States, quote, swimmable and fishable. We must recognize that to move forward in achieving this goal, it's vital for Congress and the federal government to modernize and update the Clean Water Act in a way that is fair and reasonable to all, including the regulatory, pardon me, including the regulated community, which is so integral to our economy, and I might add, is so important to our food and fiber production. Communities and stakeholders have faced years of regulatory and legal uncertainty in complying with the act. These challenges include overreach by some states when using their Section 401 authority under the Clean Water Act to certify that a project meets water quality standards. Some states have used this authority to block meaningful infrastructure projects they are politically opposed to for reasons well beyond Clean Water Act goals of water quality. There's also no greater example of overreach under the Clean Water Act than with the regulatory nightmare of complying with and understanding the de definition of waters of the United States, or WOTUS. This WOTUS definition is used to, for determining who must obtain a Section 404 Clean Water Act permit, which is well known for being a costly and time-consuming process. The WOTUS question has been debated for decades in court, and the EPA, under varying presidential administrations, has issued regulatory definitions of WOTUS that are quite expansive which was most definitely the case with the 2015 Obama EPA WOTUS rule. I'm very concerned that this administration plans to issue a similar rule that would once again place unnecessary burdens on the communities, farmers, businesses, and industries who also rely on clean water. This year, the Supreme Court announced it would be taking up a case on the definition of WOTUS, which further shows the enormous impacts these rulemakings have on citizens across the country. Now, I've joined the ranking member of the full committee and several other of my Republican colleagues to express our concerns about this administration's actions on their proposed rules and to urge the administration to consider the pending Supreme Court's ruling. 
I'm looking forward to discussing these important issues with our panel today and learning how we can work together to make the Clean Water Act more effective over the next 50 years. Um, Madam Chair, uh, this morning, uh, Ranking Member Graves, myself, and several other ranking members of House committees uh, sent a letter to the EPA and the Corps on WOTUS, which we all know is an issue of importance to the Clean Water Act. And I ask uh, unanimous consent uh, to enter uh, this letter into the record. So it ordered. Again, uh, thank you uh, to our witnesses for being here, and I look forward to our discussion. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Rosner. I've, uh, I'm pleased at this time to yield to the chair of the full committee, Mr. DeFasio, for any thoughts you may have. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Well, um, I've served here a long time, 36 years. Um, we made one major attempt at uh, uh, reauthorizing the Clean Water Act uh, when Bud Schuster was the chair. Uh, the hearing, uh, well, the markup went on for several days, and the bottom line was uh, that we would remove virtually all regulation, and if you wanted to use the water for farming, you wanted to drink it, um, you know, whatever, um, that was your responsibility, clean it up. And the bill was so bad that Newt Gingrich wouldn't even bring it to the floor. And unfortunately, now I'm hearing echoes of that, and I certainly saw reflections of that in the Trump administration. Now, I agree with uh, the, uh, the ranking member uh, when he says uh, he wants it to be more effective. I do, too. Uh, when the Clean Water Act passed, uh, you know, Lake Erie was declared dead. Dead, D-E-A-D. Cuyahoga River caught fire. I remember driving over it uh, on my way west uh, when I was in the Air Force, and they sent me to graduate school from, through Ohio. It said, do not throw lighted objects from bridge, flammable substance below. That was a river. Those are the good old days. Industry didn't have to worry about cleaning. They just dumped it in the water. Now, if you wanted to use that water for something other than a sewer, it was up to you. You, the municipality, the individual, whomever. Uh, at that point, two-thirds of the waters of the United States were significantly Do impaired. I have a list of how the... Uh, uh what? Hello? Okay, sorry. Um, Two-thirds of the waters of the U.S. were impaired. And as uh, Mr. Rogers said, I want to see it more effective. I do. I'd like to see the fact that one-third is still impaired. I'd like for all the waters of the U.S. to not be impaired. Uh, and, and there are millions of Americans who would like to be able to swim in the streams or the rivers or the lakes near their house without worrying about uh, toxic, uh, toxic chemicals or other things. And, you know, uh, so much of our society is dependent upon uh, clean water, uh, not, you know, fishable, swimmable, drinkable, farmable. Um, he mentioned North Carolina. That North Carolina has such pure water in the mountains that two of the largest breweries in America opened up there because the water is so pure. Now, they aren't going to open up in areas that have impaired water. Uh, and uh, many other businesses are dependent upon clean water, as well as our farmers uh, and uh, obviously municipalities uh, for, uh, for their citizens. So I, I'm very disturbed at you know, the general trend we've seen here, the mythology around uh, the rule. Now, I will grant you that the first rule proposed by the EPA under the Obama administration was totally indecipherable, and it allowed these bizarre rumors to arise from the Farm Bureau. Oh, if you have a bird bath in your backyard, it's going to be regulated. If there's a mud puddle, it's going to be regulated. Uh, if you've got a drainage ditch, it's going to be regulated. Um, it was really, really poorly written. Uh, they pulled back, totally rewrote it. Uh, and after a number of years, we held a hearing on it. We held it over in the Visitor Center. We had a joint hearing. I can't remember with what other committee. And the Republicans have been famously showing this farmer's field and saying, look, you know, this is the kind of thing. He's, he's, he's regulated. Yeah, he was regulated in the region. Uh, the region told him he had to get permits to expand his farm. Uh, and when I showed that slide to the then EPA administrator, I said, what would happen to this gentleman under your new rule? She said, he would be categorically exempt. The rule would have removed the ambiguity and 
the levels of enforcement that varied all around the United States depending upon the regional office uh, or local offices of the regulatory agencies or the states. Uh, it was a good rule. Then come the Trump administration, uh, and uh, we will hear from one of uh, the principals in that later today who uh, came before the committee and famously said he had no idea of the impact of the rule they were proposing, how much of the waters of the United States uh, would be removed from any regulatory burdens. He said, I think at the time, he said 18 to 71 percent. He didn't really know, but they were going to push the rule anyway. Let's find out afterwards. How much of the wetlands have we destroyed? How much of the rivers have we polluted? How many of the tributary streams have become impaired? Turned out it was 70%. It was pretty close. His upper estimate said 71. Uh, and now there are those who want to turn back the clock, and potentially including the Supreme Court of the United States, who's dealing with a bizarre divided, uh, you know, two different cases on this, uh, defining what are the regulated waters. I really don't think. And it's like a few other things that have gone on around here uh, in D.C. this last year, that the American people are going to want to know that suddenly, uh, you know, the local industry could just start dumping crap in the river again. And or, um, you know, we're not going to deal with uh, other forms of pollution. Uh, I think there'll be outrage among the Americans like there has been by some on some other recent Supreme Court decisions. So I would hope that we would uh, adopt back the attitude in 1972, 10 to 1 vote to override President Nixon's veto. And then he became ultimately famous for having passed the Clean Water Act and other environmental laws. Became part of his legacy, even though he tried to veto it and was overruled 10 to 1. Let's get back to those days. Let's do what the American people really want. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeFazio. It's uh, Mr. Sam Graves. Is he able to participate? If not, we'll go on to the witnesses. Thank you very much. We will now proceed to hear from our witness who will testify today. I ask the witnesses to please turn their cameras on and keep them on for the duration of the panel. Thank you very much for being here and very welcome to you. On today's panel, we have Joaquin Esquivel, Esquivel excuse me, Chair of the California State Water Resources Board, Michael Witt, General Counsel of Passaic Valley Sewage Commission, New York, New Jersey. Stephanie Tsosi, Senior Attorney at Earth Justice. David Ross, Partner at Trotman Pepper LLP. And of course, Laura Getz, Analyst at the Congressional Research Service. And without objection, your prepared statements will be entered into the record. And all witnesses are asked to limit their five minute uh, mark. Mr. Esquivel, you may proceed. Thank you, Chair Napolitano, and it's an honor to be here with you as well, uh, Committee Chair DeFazio and Ranking Member and, and members of the subcommittee. It's uh, an incredible moment that we have here, 50 years worth of history of progress on accessing and having universal clean water here in, in the nation, but still with a lot of challenges. So it's an honor to be here with you to discuss um, some of the, the things that we can celebrate, but also reflect on what we still have uh, to do here. I just want to reflect as well on the conversation that is here the backdrop of this celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act, which is still tension and discussion around how best we regulate, how best we achieve what, as uh, Chair DeFazio said, was pretty unanimous uh, here agreement that our water bodies were incredibly impaired, that we were needing to reconcile this, uh, this need for a, a future where we had livable, swimmable, and clean access to water and air. But I think it's important to remember that 50 years ago, it was a time as well of other discussions around civil rights, uh, around in the Endangered Species Act, uh, around other nationally important uh, pieces of legislation that were passed at a time where here, not unlike 50 years ago, we were uh, had divisions amongst us, uh, had a need to have a common vision for how we were going to continue to ensure that we had thriving economies and importantly, thriving communities. And it, so it's, it, it's not lost on me here that California actually has a special relationship with the Clean Water Act. Uh, you dial back 50 years ago and Porter Cologne was a state water quality act that was passed in 1969. And in many ways, uh, it was the direct model 
for the National Clean Water Act, the amendments to the Pollution Control Act uh, at the time, where here Justice Roby uh, in California was then uh, the author uh, in many ways of Porter Cologne um, and was our first chair here at the State Water Resources Control Board. And so this special nexus that California has with the Clean Water Act, with this discussion around how best we ensure that clean water is the basis of our modern economies here is incredibly important. What we can reflect on is a lot of progress. Uh, you look uh, up and down uh, the state in California, where here the Water Board is fortunate to regulate uh, you know, 1.3 million acres of bays and estuaries, uh, 2,100 uh, river miles, uh, 1,100 miles of coastline, and we have uh, a lot of progress to be thankful for. I think of the San, uh, the San Diego uh, Harbor and Bay. I think of here, uh, where I currently live in Sacramento, where we had discharges from wastewater treatment plants uh, going to our rivers and, and making them so polluted that we weren't able to use them to recreate them in the summer as a warming climate makes all of these, all the access to uh, the, our recreational opportunities and clean water even more challenged and important. Um, and so that, that progress is important to remind ourselves. It's easy to take for granted what is 50 years of, of uh, cleanup of our waterways and making them accessible to our communities. But we have to also acknowledge we have incredible inequities still yet. Um, we, we continue to see headlines around challenges with access to sanitation, challenges with access to clean water. And we need to make sure in this moment, these 50 years worth of progress, we don't actually uh, go back. We don't start to see uh, the, the, the incredible challenges that uh, we, we saw 50 years ago and have made progress on. And that's incumbent upon all of us re-embracing this challenge, the, the call to ensure that access to clean water uh, is, is the basis of our modern economies and doesn't impair our ability to, to enjoy the quality of life that is continuing to be challenged. We're in many ways reconciling the systems that we've inherited from the 20th century. And we certainly have a lot of 21st century challenges here amongst us. Uh, whether it is that continued inequ the inequities we see or the real challenges of the climate crisis that's in front of us, where drought, flood, and, and wildfire continue to impact the quality of our waters, the ability for us to ensure, again, that we have access to them into the future. So now is an incredible time for us to reimagine and here recommit to what is a generational need to reinvest in our water systems, ensure that access to clean water is at the core and center of, of our common good, and not let what is easy partisan politics uh, make us distracted from what is a, a, an incredible amount of success, but also an incredible opportunity to ignite the imagination of a current generation now that is watching and listening to these very discussions and wondering if uh, we here in leadership positions uh, will have the, the vision and the strength to continue to commit to access to clean water and, and let water be a, a nonpartisan door in which we can all step through and continue to, to have the critical conversations around what our future looks like and how we all contribute to it in common. Um, so thank you, it's an honor to be here. I feel privileged to be so and look forward to the further discussion here uh, on this item. Thank you, Mr. Skivel. Uh, Mr. Witt, you may proceed. Thank you. Chairs DeFazio and Napolitano, Ranking Members Graves and Rouser, and all members of the subcommittee, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies as the country prepares to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. It is an honor to be here with you this morning to discuss the vital role that public clean water agencies have played in implementing the far-reaching goals of the act, improving water quality in our nation's water bodies and protecting public health in the environment. My name is Michael Witt and I'm general counsel for the Passaic Valley Sewage Commission in Newark, New Jersey. Formed in 1897, PVSC is one of the oldest environmental agencies in the United States and we've been providing public sewer service for almost a century. I'm also a board member of NACWA, the nation's leading organization of public clean water utilities that like PVSC, are on the front lines each day working to enhance public health and the communities we proudly serve. While it is difficult to imagine today, prior to the 1970s, the most common form of wastewater treatment was simply to discharge it with little to no processing into the nearest body of water. The resulting public health and environmental damage caused across the country by this practice helped to galvanize national action 
on wastewater treatment, culminating in the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972. By many measures, the Clean Water Act has had the desired effect. More than $60 billion of initial funding in the 1970s and 80s helped create vital partnerships among the federal, state, and local governments to construct and or update wastewater treatment facilities. As a result, our nation's water quality and public health have improved dramatically, and public clean water utilities have been at the forefront of that improvement. Some examples of Clean Water Act funding successes include, as the chairman mentioned, the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio, which was so badly polluted that, yes, it actually caught on fire. Fifty years later, with the help of federal funding and my colleagues at Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, water quality in that river has been restored to the level where now it is safe to eat fish caught there again. The city of Seattle, Washington is using grants to build innovative green stormwater infrastructure to control its combined sewer system, enabling that city to cut pollution to its waterways by 75%. In Alexandria, Virginia, just across the river, Alexandria Renew Enterprises has invested in technology to capture re and reuse biogas from its treatment processes to use as a heating fuel. As a result, it has realized a 25% reduction in the emission of greenhouse gases. And at my place of work, PVSC, we use federal grants to construct an advanced secondary treatment process that went operational in 1981. This allows us to provide wastewater treatment services to over 1.5 million people, one out of every six residents in the state of New Jersey, making PVSC the single most important public health infrastructure investment in the state's history. These projects and many others like them were funded in part by the Clean Water Act. The act has also had major social and economic impact. Thanks to water quality improvements since 1972, access to outdoor water recreational opportunities has been greatly upgraded and expanded to tens of millions of Americans. These activities generate $175 billion per year in annual spending and are directly responsible for more than 1.5 million jobs. Cities both large and small are experiencing revitalizations of their once polluted waterfronts with major investments being made in housing, small business development, and entertainment venues. Investment in wastewater also provides employment. Today, approximately one out of every 300 working Americans is employed in the clean water sector in a variety of well-paid local jobs. These jobs provide opportunities across a diverse spectrum of educational and skill set backgrounds. But while we celebrate the success of the last 50 years, we must acknowledge the challenges ahead. We must maintain and update the clean water infrastructure that we have, while at the same time, plan and build for the future. We must be able to address new pollutant standards, population growth, and agricultural and industrial expansion, land development pressures, and a changing climate that directly impacts water and wastewater systems. This requires strengthening and maintaining the partnership between the federal, state, and local governments, especially on the issue of water, clean water funding. While the Act and other funding initiatives provide vital support, they do not meet the need for clean water infrastructure investment, which is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Thus, it is imperative that in the coming fiscal years, Congress fully appropriate all authorized funding measures such as those under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Even with federal assistance, the vast majority of clean water investment in infrastructure will, be continue, will continue to be made by our ratepayers, our customers, and many residents will be pushed up against the limits of affordability. We must, therefore, fully embrace the concepts of environmental justice and ensuring the equitable provision of clean water and, and water services for all. Together, public clean water utilities, states, and federal governments can continue the important progress made on both the investment and policy fronts and see the next 50 years of the Clean Water Act result in even greater in in achievements. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak before you today. This concludes my oral testimony, and I'll be happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you, Mr. Witt. That's very much. Uh, Ms. Tosi, you're uh, recognized. Yad Ash is Stephanie Sosi and Shah Hunahi and Schlen Kiani Bashin Bahali de Nasha. Thank you, Chair Napolitano, Ranking Member Rouser, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Stephanie Sosi and I am a member of the Navajo Nation. Currently, I serve as a senior attorney in the Tribal Partnerships Program at Earth Justice. In my role as a litigator and advocate at Earth Justice, I have the immense honor and privilege to represent and work with tribal clients across the country. I am joining you this morning from the Fort McDowell Yavapai Reservation in the state now known as Arizona, a land that is home to many tribal nations, including my own. 
It seems appropriate that I get the opportunity to testify today on the Clean Water Act from a place where water is so precious. In the 50 years since the Clean Water Act was passed, it has been an instrumental resource for communities and tribal governments in protecting water resources. The goals of the Clean Water Act are clear, to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. Despite this clear directive, many of our clients and partners are faced with challenges in achieving these goals. This includes threats to narrow the scope of the Clean Water Act and limiting the protections that it provides to our streams, wetlands, and water resources. Indeed, it is a tribe from here in Arizona that successfully litigated an attempt by the Trump administration to narrow the Clean Water Act's applicability. The Pasquayaki tribe, along with other tribal plaintiffs, filed a lawsuit in federal district court to challenge that Trump era rule. Under that interpretation of the Clean Water Act, nearly 1,500 streams in New Mexico and Arizona would fall outside the protection of the Clean Water Act. This would have caused significant harm to tribal communities here in the Southwest. Fortunately, a new EPA took back the rule and the federal court vacated its applicability. Our tribal clients prevailed in keeping the Clean Water Act protections for the arid Southwest and its pressure water resources intact. Unfortunately, the Clean Water Act's jurisdiction is an open question in front of the court once again. Our tribal clients and partners filed an amicus brief to the Supreme Court of the United States in the case Sackett v. EPA in hopes of educating both the court and the public of the importance of the Clean Water Act for tribal communities. Clean Water Act jurisdiction is fundamental for our tribal clients to participate in the process for protecting water both on and off tribal lands. The permitting requirements set forth in the various sections of the Clean Water Act provide an avenue for communities to be involved in reviewing the proposed projects that have an impact on our valuable water resources. Our tribal clients and partners have used these tools successfully, but they have also faced significant challenges. My written testimony details a few of these successes and pitfalls our tribal clients and partners have faced within the statutory schema of the Clean Water Act. Unfortunately, one source of these pitfalls can be traced either to the lack of consultation or insufficient consultation with tribes. As I am sure this committee is aware, the federal government has a trust responsibility to tribal nations, which includes the duty to consult. Our tribal clients and partners have been stewards of the waters in their respective territories since time immemorial and have a vested interest in continuing that stewardship. However, the Army Corps of Engineers and EPA must also be a part of that process to meaningfully engage with tribes on how programs and projects carried out under the Clean Water Act will affect tribal water resources. The Clean Water Act has the tools that tribes can use to protect water, but the future of the Clean Water Act depends on federal agencies using those tools appropriately. I encourage this committee to use its oversight authority to encourage EPA and the Corps to do just that. And I look forward to working with federal agencies to make the implementation of the Clean Water Act more effective. The Clean Water Act has been a valuable resource in the past for our tribal clients and partners, but it is by no means the end of the road to protecting our tribal waters. The ongoing impacts of climate change and its effects on tribal communities make protecting our water resources even more critical. Water is essential for tribal communities to thrive. Water is life. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ms. Tosi. Uh, Mr. Ross, you recognize, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Napolitano, Ranking Member Rouser, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. It truly is an honor to be back before the committee. You know, I've spent the majority of my career working in or around the Clean Water Act in some capacity whether or not that's representative clients in the private sector on how to comply with the Clean Water Act or working for the state of Wyoming, uh, advising the agency on how to implement uh, the Clean Water Act and its programs, or serving as a lead environmental prosecutor for the state of Wisconsin, where we prosecuted Clean Water Act or state delegated Clean Water Act style cases. And then I also had the honor of running the Clean Water Act program for the federal government. And I can say with all of that experience, uh, I can say unequivocally, that the Clean Water Act actually is transformative. Um, so uh, to whoever came up with the, the, the title for this hearing, uh, Gold Star, uh, it, it's very accurate. I also believe uh, the Clean Water Act is, is, if not the most, it's certainly one of the most impactful, important pieces of legislation this Congress or Congress has ever passed. 
Um, so uh, congratulations and thank you for holding this hearing. Now, I do believe it is important to take the time to look back, to reflect, uh, to take a look at our successes. I think they're invigorating. I think they will inspire work uh, as we look around the corner as, as the work that remains left to do. Um, it also allows us to take a look back and, and see where we've had some, some gaps, some problems. Uh, is the act right now uh, you know, you know, ready to be applied for the next 50 years? And so this, this type of hearing, uh, looking back, helps us think about whether or not we need to make enhancements to the act or whether or not we have funding, et cetera. So, you know, the, uh, you know, so congratulations. Um, uh, without question, and as you've heard other witnesses in the opening statements, I think the Clean Water Act has been a success. Um, in fact, if you take a look at the Association of Clean Water Administrators, ACWA, as they're called, because you know the water uh, community loves its acronyms, they have this really, really cool uh, uh, interactive uh, book. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure there's a technical name for it, but effectively, it's a storybook. And you can go spend some time taking a look at the great successes that the Clean Water Act is responsible for. I do encourage members of the subcommittee to take a look at that. Um, in my personal experience, those, those stories are representative of the successes that the Clean Water Act has been responsible for. Um, but we have major work left to do, uh, by no question. In fact, we have far, far too many rivers and lakes that are still impaired. Um, I think we have a, a major challenge. We've done a nice job with conventional pollutants, heavy metals. Uh, things like that, but we have major, major work to do with nutrients. I think for certain uh, contaminants like nutrients, uh, things aren't getting better. I think they're probably getting worse. Uh, we have emerging contaminant issues like PFAS and others that we're going to have to grapple with. You know, we're still having questions about definitional uh, issues, which I think after 50 years is unfortunate. Uh, but, you know, so there's no question we have work to do. But for me, I want to highlight in my opening statement sort of what I see as the big three going forward uh, for what the Clean Water Act needs to focus on. The first, you've heard it, and it's important, it's infrastructure. Uh, congratulations to this Congress for, for financing significant investments and in helping us upgrade our water and wastewater systems. Um, uh, it's not enough, and I think we need, going forward, the courage to be able to fund, on an annual basis, greater investments in our communities. You know, our, our local communities are making those investments, but I think it's you know, incumbent upon the federal government and state governments to help finance that, to help the private sector finance that. Um, you, know, you know, look, I'm concerned about the future financial viability, uh, you know, future generations. I'm concerned on how much money we're spending, but, um, you know, I have a little bit of bias in the water sector. And so I, I fully support additional uh, investment for infrastructure. I am really happy we're having a serious national conversation about affordability. I do congratulate this administration for its focus on environmental justice, a focus on getting resources to disadvantaged communities. I think it's time, um, and I think it's, it's admirable that the work that they're doing. You know, I think we have to be aware of what drives affordability. Affordability is an environmental justice issue, but what causes it is multifaceted. And so as we think about structuring regulations going forward under the Clean Water Act, we also must remember that there are drinking water issues, storm water issues, and all those converge on a single rate pair. And so we, we have to keep that in mind. That single rate pair uh, is the affordability question. And, and we always must keep our eyes on that ball. And finally, I think the most important issue, and it certainly does not get talked enough about, and I think Congress really needs to spend some time thinking about it, is the workforce issue. We would not be having a discussion about the success of the Clean Water Act without the dedicated professionals who actually implement it at the water and wastewater treatment plants. We have a dire situation facing us over the next decade with the retirement profile. The retirements are richly earned, but we need to be thinking about that workforce pipeline. We are investing billions of dollars in infrastructure, but if we do not invest in human capital, it, those investments in the infrastructure will be wasted. So congratulations on this hearing. I look forward to participating. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Gus, Ross, very much for your comments. And now we go to Ms. Getz. You're on, Ms. Getz. Chairwoman Napolitano, Chair DeFazio, Ranking Member Rouser, and members of the subcommittee, good morning. I am Laura Gatz, an environmental policy analyst for the Congressional Research Service. On behalf of CRS, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to testify. As requested by the subcommittee, my testimony focuses on the Clean Water Act's history and goals, 
selected trends in its implementation, and remaining challenges. Growing concern about sewage and industrial waste polluting our nation's waterways prompted enactment of the Federal Water Pollution Control Act in 1948. The act was the first major law Congress enacted specifically to address water pollution. It was designed to control pollution primarily through state efforts with a limited federal role. By the 1970s, frustration over the pace of cleanup, increased public interest in environmental protection, and a growing perception that existing law was inadequate set the stage for major changes to the statute. On October 18, 1972, Congress passed sweeping amendments to the, clean, to the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, which became known as the Clean Water Act. The amendments significantly reorganized and expanded the statute establishing a new framework to control water pollution. The amendment set ambitious goals for water quality, established the structure for regulating pollutant discharges, and increased federal assistance for wastewater treatment facility construction. The amendments expanded the federal role, giving the recently established EPA authority to implement the Act's programs while retaining the state's role in day-to-day -day implementation. The Clean Water Act's objective, as stated in 1972, is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. The Act also established two goals, to eliminate the discharge of pollutants into navigable waters by 1985, and as an interim goal, to achieve water quality that is fishable and swimmable by July 1, 1983. While those dates have long passed, efforts to attain the goals continue. The past 50 years of Clean Water Act implementation have yielded improvements. The Act's funding and permitting programs have done much to reduce direct discharges of sewage and industrial waste to the nation's waterways. The 1972 Clean Water Act authorized grants for wastewater fa treatment facility construction. Between 1973 and 1990, Congress appropriated nearly $52 billion under the program, representing the largest non-military public works program since the interstate highway system. In 1987, Clean Water Act amendments effectively replaced the grants program with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund program, which has since received more than $49 billion in appropriations. States, EPA and states have used their permitting authorities under the Clean Water Act to reduce discharges from direct or point sources of pollution. As these sources became better controlled over time, attention turned to the remaining sources preventing attainment of water quality goals including stormwater discharges and non-point or diffuse sources of pollution. The amendments to the Clean Water Act in 1987 added stormwater permitting requirements. In the decades following promulgation of these requirements, many municipalities have faced challenges in implementing and funding efforts to manage stormwater. The 1987 amendments also established requirements for states to develop plans to address non-point source pollution. Since that time, concern about non-point source pollution and its significance to remaining water quality issues has persisted. Notably, EPA recognizes that nutrient pollution, much of which comes from non-point sources such as runoff from agricultural and residential areas, is one of the nation's most challenging water quality problems. The Clean Water Act does not authorize EPA to regulate non-point sources, which some observe as a challenge in achieving the Act's objectives. The Clean Water Act has also yielded some success through its place-based restoration programs, including its geographic programs and national estuary program, which have bolstered stakeholder coordination, leveraged resources, and led to the development of comprehensive restoration plans. Challenges remain as population growth, development, and climate-related impacts limit progress in addressing remaining water quality issues. In addition, Infrastructure funding needs persist as states and localities address aging systems and needs for increased capacity and resilience. These and other aspects of implementation will continue to present Congress, EPA, states, and others with hurdles in their efforts to achieve the ambitious goals of the Act. This concludes my brief remarks. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Getch. Uh, now we will proceed to uh, um, hear, uh, thank you to all our witnesses. We will now move to a member of questions and each member will be recognized for five minutes. And I begin with Chairman DeFasio for question. Mr. DeFasio, you're recognized. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks uh, to all the uh, witnesses uh, for their testimony. Uh, I think there was unanimity among the witnesses that the Clean Water Act is very important. Uh, wastewater infrastructure is very important, and uh, those, those are great points. But I, I, I do want to just hark back to the threats. Uh, and the threats come because of litigation over the Trump uh, dirty water rule and uh, a conflicted uh, you know, Supreme Court decision from many years ago, two different decisions. Now, uh, my question for Mr. Ross, three years ago, you testified before this subcommittee, uh, and um, you, know, you uh, were promoting what we have come to call the Trump uh, dirty water rule. And um, at the time, I asked you, how many streams and wetlands uh, would lose uh, protection uh, under that rule? And you said again and again and again and again and again, we don't know. And I thought, well, it, it, do you really want to put forward a rule and you don't know what the impact is going to be on massive uh, tributaries and, and the scope of the rule and its impact on pollution? But um, the administration pressed ahead. And when you testified, there were leaked documents from EPA saying between 18 and 71 percent would be impaired, uh, and uh, roughly 50 percent of all wetlands would be jeopardized, uh, wetlands being very critical. Um, now, uh, we do have those documents, and it came out to 70 percent. 70 percent would have been uh, at risk under that rule. Uh, do you have any doubt to uh, the accuracy of these analyses, Mr. Ross? Uh, thank you, Chair, for the question. You know, I, I do think there are some you know, questions about well, the let's, accuracy. Come on, the let's, let's get to the point. Do you doubt the accuracy? Would it have had a major impact somewhere around 70% would be uh, removed from jurisdiction? But yes, Chair, or no? I, I, yes or no? I think that data needs to be analyzed holistically in context. And so I, I you know, I, I haven't okay, been so there. Okay, so you can't answer. Have, so despite your outstanding testimony today, which I thought would have come from, you know, uh, either a municipal or someone representing wastewater people and all the great things you talked about there, um, what good does it do us to spend incredible amounts of money cleaning up the wastewater when some industry uh, our agricultural group has just dumped a bunch of crap in there, which is making the water no longer fishable, swimmable, upstream and downstream. That doesn't really help. So I, you know, I appreciate the little bit of whitewashing. I, you know, I assume the firm you work for knows your history, or whoever your clients are knows your history. But um, you seem like a very different person here today, and um, it doesn't seem like you're going to answer any more. Uh, honestly than you did uh, three years ago. Um, I do appreciate you saying we should increase funding. I hope that your Republican colleagues on that side of the aisle listen. Um, you know, that was the first reauthorization of the SRF since 87. We proposed a much larger number here in the House, uh, which was opposed by my Republican colleagues. Luckily, the Senate was a little bit more enlightened, uh, and we got a decent amount of money, but as you noted, we need much, much more uh, around the nation. Um, do um, any other members of the panel wish uh, to opine upon the uh, jeopardy proposed by uh, any reinstatement of the uh, Trump dirty water rule or uh, a successful defense of its uh, implications? Anyone want to testify to that? Anyone other than Mr. Ross? Okay, that's a pretty quiet panel. All right, no one? Okay. Uh, how about the importance of investment in wastewater? Anybody want to comment on that? I got 36 seconds left. Go ahead, Mr. Witt. Thank you, Chairman. I, I would love to comment on that. Um, it's absolutely critical that we continue investment in wastewater and you have to look no further than things that happen in places like Jackson, Mississippi, to find out what happens when we don't invest in wastewater and in clean water and in drinking water as well. Um, you know, in the industry, and all of the NACWA members and, and 
people who aren't NACWA members, pride ourselves on the jobs we do. You don't really hear about problems with wastewater plants because they don't happen very often. But when they do, it can be catastrophic. And without the proper investment in clean water industry, it will start happening again. I can tell you that at my place of employment, uh, you know, we have lines, as I said, we've been treating, providing public wastewater services for almost a century now. We have sewer lines that are 100 years old. Mm. They were built by hand by immigrants coming over from Europe, straight from Ellis Island, put mm. to work, and beautiful brickwork, beautiful woodwork, all these beautiful facilities, but they're not going to last forever. They have outlived their usefulness, and that's the same all up and down the East Coast. You know, as you move further west in newer communities, you have newer sewer lines. But in particular, where you have older sewer lines in urban centers, and, and especially where disadvantaged people live, and, and people who do suffer the adverse impacts of environmental justice, you know, you've got a lot of old infrastructure there, and these people are at risk. They're at risk. There's no uh, other way to sorry. put it. Okay, no. I, thank, I thank the gentleman. I thank the uh, chair for her indulgence. Uh, that was a, a very comprehensive answer. We are much at risk. Uh, even when I was a county commissioner, we built a system with 85% federal assistance. Still working great, uh, but it's now 50 years old. That's a, a new one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeFascio. Mr. Russell, you're recognized. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Ross, I, uh, I was interested in your answer, uh, and I know you didn't uh, quite get an opportunity to fully fully explain your perspective there. Uh, if you want to go back to the uh, chairman's question and, and elaborate just a little bit. And, and my own comment, too, uh, I think it's important uh, that we have balance. Um, you know, you could shut down all industry, you could shut down all activity, and, you know, that would probably help clean up the water, too. But that's not obviously uh, 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 realistic. Or, uh, or even appropriate. Uh, you got to have balance with, with this. Uh, so, would you like to comment further, Mr. Ross? Yeah, sure. Thank you. You know, I, you know, I, I recognize that there's passion. Obviously, passion may be the most diverse, divisive, or divisive issue. I can't even talk um, uh, in the Clean Water Act. But uh, you know, the, the number one point I want to make on that on that data issue is I think the federal government had failed for decades. We really don't have a resource map. Of our of our regulated waters, and you know, you know, I I, I like the Obama administration before me. Um, we we were sort of operating in the dark, and so we started a mapping effort collaboratively with the Corps of Engineers, the Department of Interior, EPA, and other federal agencies, try to build that data. Um, with that said, it's, it's a ten year effort to build that data, and you you do have to provide some clarity as to the scope of the Clean Water Act, and so. You know, the Obama administration, you know, the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration are trying to provide that clarity. And it's a really, really difficult issue. Speaking of clarity, it appears the EPA is uh, rushing to finish their rule before a de decision in the Sackett uh, case. Uh, based on your experience, do you think it's wise for an agency to be undertaking a rule about its own scope of authority when the Supreme Court is considering that very same issue? Shouldn't the uh, EPA wait for the Supreme Court's ruling? Uh... Well, you know, if I was there, I let me answer it this way. I, I may make a different decision, but I do understand the drivers. Uh, so I, I get the reasons why they're doing it. Uh, but, you know, I think you know, the chance of providing the Supreme Court finally providing some clarity is a good thing. And it would be nice to have the, the federal regulatory process uh, match what uh, whatever decision the Supreme Court may make. So the administration uh, claims in its press statements that its part one WOTUS rule is just a return to the pre-2015 standard. Uh, is this actually the case based on what you know? Well, I, I think uh, we'll have to see what, how they finalize the rule. You know, the, the rule is now sitting over in OMB. Uh, I think some folks have made some comments about that. I think it's, uh, it, it drifts a bit towards the, the 2015 rule, at least it did in the proposal. Um, and so we'll we'll have to see how it comes out in final, but I I, th I think it was it was more than a return to the eighty six uh, framework. Uh, Mr. Witt, I want to uh, move to you real quickly. Uh, you know, PFAS is a big issue uh, for us in North Carolina and elsewhere around the country. Uh, can you discuss the impact that uh, regulations might have on clean water agencies and other utilities as it relates to PFAS? Uh, if those regulations are 
are not given appropriate thought and, and balance and, and consideration? Thank you, Ranking Member, for the question. Uh, yeah, it's, this is a, an extremely important issue for all clean water agencies, and we support, NACWA supports, the further and ongoing efforts under the Clean Water Act to delineate and understand exactly the scope of the PFAS problem, where we have a real problem, and I personally have described this to my colleagues as having the potential to be catastrophic, cataclysmic, whatever word you want to use there, is the expansion uh, of PFAS to be included as a hazardous substance under CERCLA, under the Superfund law, and the potential impact that could have on clean water agencies if there is not a congressional exemption for clean water agencies uh, with regard to that definition. Clean water agencies don't use PFAS. We don't make PFAS. We don't benefit from PFAS. We don't profit from PFAS at all. But if there's not an exclusion under CERCLA for wastewater entities, we're going to be held liable for it because we get it through the sewers. We are a passive recipient of PFAS. We can't stop it from coming into the sewer system, but now we might be held liable for discharging it when it goes through our treatment process. And nobody's treatment process at this point is geared towards removing PFAS. PFAS, the reason that we have the PFAS problem is because they are so biopersistent. It's very difficult to treat them, and there isn't even an agreed upon treatment method yet. So until that's developed, holding clean water agencies responsible for discharging PFAS is holding our ratepayers responsible for discharging PFAS. People who did not make them, people who do not benefit from them monetarily, but that's who will be asked to pay in part for those, those issues. And that is why it is such an important issue to us to have the exemption under the law if, it, if hazardous substances are, PFAS are included as hazardous substances. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Rouser. Uh, I will now recognize myself for five minutes, and I will start with Chairman Esquivel. It's great to see you again. Uh, much of California residents and farms receive water that starts as ephemeral or intermittent streams. If they are polluted, Californians will bear the cost of cleaning the water before it's drinkable, serviceable, and usable. Can you discuss how important it is to protect them? Yes, I really appreciate the, the question. And to maybe touch upon some of the discussion that we've been having around, and I appreciate the ranking member's word, balance for uh, the protection of, of our beneficial uses. Uh, I'll, I'll note, uh, many of California's waters originate within the state, um, flow within the state, don't uh, cross interstate borders. And so we use uh, Port of Cologne, our own authorities to, to regulate them and including expanding our, our definition for wetlands. So as this expanding and contracting jurisdictional discussion on the Clean Water Act happens, California can protect its waters and protect itself. But this has the most impact on our interstate waters, the Colorado River. Here front, front and center of many of our thoughts is we address the quantity issues on that river, but so too are important are the quality issues that especially in a drying and arid climate become so fundamental in the arid west to protect, to ensure that we, we are, are here as the basis of our, our economies here, truly protecting that and the polluters amongst that system are paying. And so there, uh, ensuring that, that ephemeral streams, which again, especially in the west, you know, I had a, a great fortune of being in DC for about a decade. So I know the east and its water management can seem very different than what we have to manage in the west. But the, our waterways uh, are, are incredibly different. We have ephemeral streams. They're not, they don't free flow during the entire year and they deserve protection because when water does run down them, when we have storms, when we have, and especially in increasing and warming climate floods, they can overwhelm and really impact our ability to continue to use our water as well. And so it's incredibly important that this jurisdictional issue uh, be uh, addressed. And importantly, we find some common ground here on how best we really lend ourselves to the science, um, the, the interconnectivity, the, the biological, as we've said, and chemical integrity of our waterways. Thank you, sir. Um, I yield to Mr. Fasio if you would like to have the time. Mr. DeFacio? And that, then I will, uh, again, Mr. Esquivel, many sanitation agencies in our state are working towards water use and recycling to address our drought conditions. What are the issues, issues the state board is focusing to support re water recycling? 
Thank you, Congresswoman, uh, Chair. Uh, here, so proudly, is the fact that the State Water Resources Control Board has actually been able to invest $1.8 billion, along with, importantly, our local leaders and partners in water recycling projects in the state of California. That means in these next years, we'll have an additional 124,000 acre feet of water, enough to support you know, nearly six, uh, you know, 600,000 uh, homes here uh, with, with clean water and with a, a warming climate we know that we're going to have to continue to invest in these 21st century systems, water recycling, and, and maximizing our use of our, our water resources, particularly in the arid west. Uh, and there, it's an incredible thing that we're actually going to be next year adopting direct potable reuse regulations, which will usher in a whole new generation of projects, not unlike water recycling did here in the early 70s in California. We look to be uh, the leaders in ensuring that we're expanding our water supply portfolio, even as we adapt to what we know will be a hotter and arid future. Thank you. Uh, under the last administration, efforts were made to roll back protections under Section 401. Uh, and uh, the state board adopted its own wetland policy in response to continue to ensure continued compliance. Can you discuss the importance of strong Section 401? And I only got a few minutes. Yeah, I'll note that California, you know, as I said uh, during my remarks, we're really reconciling this system that we've inherited. And there's been a lot of decisions that have been made that have actually worked against having access to clean water and ensuring it for our communities, no more so than the paving over and development of 95% of the state's wetlands. So that last 5% that we have left, the need to actually grow it is so important and is why the definition for wetlands, better incorporating those protections in our, our policies was critical to responding to, again, what are these different jurisdictional issues when it comes to ephemeral streams or here, definitions of things um, like the wetlands in the scope of 401 uh, regulations. And, you know, again, going to this theme of balance, uh, here we have to remember that we are reconciling our systems and on balance, we have to be protecting our communities uh, and ensuring that clean water is uh, enacts the, the, the basis for our modern economies. Thank you very much, sir. I will now move to Mr. Garrett Graves. You recognize, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, I want to join the chorus of folks, uh, Ranking Member Rouser, the, uh, yourself as well as, Chairman De, as well as Chairman DeFazio, in celebrating some of the successes of the Clean Water Act. There's no question that the, that the law has resulted in benefits to many communities and, and our environment across the United States in many cases. Um, I also want to want to highlight because I think we need to stay focused on building on successes and addressing deficiencies. Um, Madam Chair, in my home state of Louisiana, we've lost 2,000 square miles of our coast, 2,000 square miles of our coast, which are jurisdictional wetlands. They're jurisdictional wetlands. The primary cause of the loss is the very agency that's in charge of regulating wetlands. Uh, that would be the Corps of Engineers under the under the delegated authority. So, th so there is something that we need to be kind of pausing on and thinking about. How is this law that's supposed to be protecting our wetlands resulted in the agency in charge with regulating them, the greatest loss of wetlands in the United States history? And this isn't just historic, this is ongoing because of how they manage the Mississippi River system and our water resources. No question. As Rouser, as, as our chairman have noted, no question there have been successes we need to celebrate. Gaping holes and failures that need to be addressed. There's another one. I've heard folks talk about 401. 401 certification certainly has a place in that, in that states need to have a role in, in looking at water resources, looking at certification, and ensuring that we're not carrying out actions at the federal level that are adversely affecting our environment, adversely affecting states. However, We've got to look at the consequences of that and ensure that those decisions are confined to the intents of 401. We have watched as states have come in, misapplied 401 in ways to achieve their objectives related to climate change goals. Ironically, and, and what I mean by that is blocking interstate gas pipelines. Ironically, their very efforts to use 401 to achieve their climate change goals have actually resulted in greater emissions, resulted in 
consumers paying more for energy prices by blocking, for example, natural gas pipelines up into the Northeast, only to watch Vladimir Putin go on Twitter and troll the United States because we chose then the only option to bring in liquefied natural gas from Russia. We've we, it resulted in us having to burn home heating oil, which has greater emissions. These are boneheaded decisions that are clearly outside of the scope of the Clean Water Act. Now, I heard the Chairman DeFazio talking about the, the clean water rule and, and, and the dirty water rule, which I'm not sure what that is. I, I haven't seen that one yet. But I, I, I'm curious, Mr. Ross, you have a very active Supreme Court case right now, uh, Sackett versus EPA. And that is before the Supreme Court, clearly the court, as it has multiple times, is getting ready to step in and effectively redefine or at least put some parameters on the Clean Water Act, on, on WOTUS. Why, based on your experience having served at EPA, why would an agency go out and do a final rule when they're getting ready to have a parameter change? And does that make sense? Or should we wait for the Sackett decision to then inform a final rule? Mr. Mr. Ross? But as I said earlier, I, you know, I may have chosen to, to make a different decision and let the Supreme Court act. You know, I, uh, you know, we don't know exactly, it's hard to predict um, what the Supreme Court's going to do. Is, gonna, is it going to, uh, you know, provide the final clarity and, and overcome the mistakes of its earlier decisions and, and really disrupting Clean Water Act jurisdiction and creating this confusion? Or is it going to rule more narrowly? And so, you know, to the extent that they're moving forward uh, to the, you know, with, without the Supreme Court acting, you know, I get it. Um, again, I might not have made that decision, and I do think it is more likely than not that we will get some clarity from the Supreme Court on some pretty important issues, and it will be nice to then uh, integrate that into whatever federal rule uh, comes out after that. Th thank you, Mr. Ross. Quick, quick second question for you. Um, in looking at the administration's regulatory agenda, how they're carrying out regulations, uh, yet looking at how they're trying to similarly achieve infrastructure project completion or execution, things like implementing water projects across the United States, they're actually being hampered or impeded by the regulatory agenda, and I think that I think that the, the Clean Water Act is, a, is an example of that and the need to modernize the regulatory process. If you could just quickly comment on, on, the, on the proposed Waters of the U.S. regulations and how it's going to impact much-needed water infrastructure projects. Well, I, I think there's a tension between the need to modernize our water infrastructure, our renewable energy infrastructure, whatever it is. You know, the federal permitting process is long, difficult, and expensive. And without clarity into the scope of jurisdiction, uh, folks are uh, uh, at you know having to grapple with how to you know to go through the permitting process, and so I think I think there's tension there, um, a tension that needs to be resolved. Thank you. You're back. Thank you very much, Mr. Grace. Uh, Mr. Huffman, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member, for holding this important hearing to recognize the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. This very important act serves as one of our nation's foundational environmental laws. It's an important tool allowing us to better protect our communities and our environment. But sadly, 50 years later, we still have to defend a community's right to clean water and defend the Clean Water Act itself from attempts to weaken it. Uh, Chairman DeFazio uh, did a great job talking about how the Trump administration in 2020 tried to implement their dirty water rule to significantly limit the type of waterways that would even qualify for protection, uh, as well as the rights of states and tribes under Section 401 of the Clean Water Act. Uh, this, of course, is where they have the authority to review, certify, and potentially block harmful projects within their jurisdiction. Now, thankfully, the Biden administration's proposed 401 rule will further safeguard these important protections. But despite all of this, uh, we may potentially see before us so-called permitting reform language from a Senate backroom deal. And what we know about this comes from uh, a leaked uh, American Petroleum Institute watermarked version of text that would weaken 401 protections to significantly narrow the scope of projects that states and tribes can review as well as to change uh, the time frame for them to conduct their environmental reviews. And so I'd like to begin with a question to uh, Ms. Sosi. Um, in your testimony, ma'am, you talked about how uh, several tribes have successfully used Section 401 programs to regulate water quality, and you went on to say that if that section is weakened, 
many of those tribes will lose one of the strongest tools they have uh, to work with states and to weigh in on potentially damaging projects and ensure their resources are protected. Can you talk a little more about how a narrower scope or a shorter time frame will impact tribes and their ability to protect their uh, water quality resources? Thank you, Representative Huffman. Uh, Section 401 is a strong tool for tribal governments to review water quality and the impacts that projects will have on tribal uh, waters, both on and off reservation. Narrowing the scope of that review in any way, such as narrowing the project review, um, narrowing the impacts that might be uh, evaluated under that review can have significant impacts. These projects are not proposed in a vacuum. Um, they often have secondary effects or they'll have effects that if you narrow the scope can't be seen. And so it is important that we look at the entire project's impacts as a whole, as part of the 401 process. Um, further, shortening the timeline or placing a timeline at all uh, really is an arbitrary move and can um, complicate the review of these projects, leading either to a denial where a project might otherwise have been approved or an approval that falls short of protecting water quality standards. Um, it also places an unreasonable burden on tribes to do that review within that timeline. And so, um, that process has nothing to do with protecting water quality um, if, we're, if we're placing that timeline there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Esquivel, same question to you from the perspective of the state. Uh, what does it mean if the state only has six months to review a project instead of a year, or if a state is limited to only reviewing these quote unquote water quality requirements of state law? These are the type of restrictions proposed uh, in the uh, in the outline of the side deal that we've seen, um, why is that a problem from the perspective of California water quality uh, protection? Thank you, I appreciate the question. And I think we have to remember that we have here an inherited history of really bad decision-making. And while I, I, I appreciate and acknowledge that there is a tension around permitting, around getting the, the, the infrastructure investments that we know we need into our communities, and doing so at the pace that the urgency that climate change is really putting on us is important, but we can't uh, afford ourselves here to continue, continue to make bad decisions quickly. Uh, we have to be able to balance here, importantly, uh, how we make the right considerations, how we evaluate projects in a way that yes, we should, we should you know, concentrate on how we do that expeditiously, but also how we do that well and not put arbitrary timelines onto what are very difficult and sometimes significant projects that need uh, the time and consideration, but can also deal with improvements around the way we look at data, the way we evaluate, we in common seeing uh, what uh, the, we need to best uh, match up against our considerations when we're doing these investments. All right, uh, thank you, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Huffman. Uh, Mr. Lamalfa, are you there? Mr. Lamalfa. Now proceed to the next to the next member, Mr. Melanowski. You're on, please. Mr. Melanowski. Hi. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you to all our witnesses. Um, I, and. Uh, you know, we're, we are marking an anniversary here of, of a law that I, I think has done tremendous good for the American uh, people. And as we, we look forward, I think it's important for us to look backward on, on what it has done. Uh, Mr. Witt, you and I are both from New Jersey. I think uh, we, can, uh, we, we can talk forever about the changes that have uh, occurred in our state over the last 50 years for the better because of the uh, the Clean Water Act, and I think it's worth reviewing um, some of those. Uh, I, I think you mentioned in your testimony um, that prior to the 1970s, the most common form of industrial, commercial, and residential wastewater treatment, quote unquote, was simply to discharge it with little to no actual processing into the nearest stream, river, lake, or ocean. Um, and we, we, we certainly experienced that in, in New Jersey in the early 1900s, for example, chemical and plastics companies like the American uh, Cyanamid uh, Company 
dumped hundreds of thousands of pounds of chemical waste into the Raritan River that flows through my district. At the height of World War II, industrial waste was regularly dumped into our Delaware River. It became basically an open sewer. It was said that the river's water was so dirty that um, it would turn the paint of, of ships uh, running through the river brown. Uh, and today, there are kids and families swimming and tubing in that river in my district every year. And along the Passaic, which of course you know very well, where industry boomed in the 19th century into the 20th, more than 100 industrial facilities have been identified as potentially responsible for discharging contaminants uh, in, into the river, according to the EPA. Um, since then, since 1972, New Jersey, like many other states, have taken, I think, extraordinary steps to clean up our waters, to keep them clean. We're modernizing our aging water infrastructure. We're punishing polluters. We're defending the law at every opportunity, including during the previous administration when the law was on the chopping block. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask if you might be willing to reflect a little bit uh, on that progress that uh, that we have made, and perhaps share some thoughts about where you see us going with the Clean Water Act for the next 50 years to deal with the, the very real challenges we still face in New Jersey. Thank you for the question, Congressman. And uh, I, I happen to live right across the street from the Congressman's district uh, uh, and live near the American Cyanamid Project uh, Superfund site that the Congressman referred to. Uh, I live in Bound Brook, New Jersey, which is right where it is, right along the banks of the Raritan River. And certainly we have made a tremendous amount of impact uh, in those areas and along the Passaic River. I, I would, however, like to tie this back into the work that we still need to do. And as the committee, I'm sure, is aware, um, the Superfund law was created in large part because of New Jersey. New Jersey has more Superfund sites than anywhere in the United States. Uh, and so, Looking at the Clean Water Act and where we can go in the future is, again, the importance of continuing to fund infrastructure, not only in New Jersey, but elsewhere, all around the country, in order to stop the, pollu the continued pollution of these waterways, because they're already at the point where it's too much, and we need to stop adding to the problem and start resolving the problem. But again, getting back to the ranking member's uh, point uh, about developments with CERCLA, and certainly with regard to Congressman Malinowski's statement about the Passaic River, yes, that is exactly where uh, Agent Orange was made for the Vietnam War, the defoliant that we used in the Vietnam War. And dioxin is one of the byproducts of making Agent Orange. It's basically the most toxic substance that human beings know how to make that is not radioactive. And the company that is by and large responsible for making most of that dioxin just dumped it into the Passaic River. We are now involved in the largest Superfund case in U.S. history along that river. There are some estimates by Region 2 of EPA that it could cost as much as 10 to 12 billion dollars to clean up that river. And at this point, 44 public entities, municipalities in New Jersey, 45 public entities, including PVSC, have been drawn into that lawsuit by the other polluters because there is no exemption under the law for wastewater facilities. So you've got the situation now where basically you have millions of customers who are going to be paying potentially for the privilege of having their river poisoned for the last 80 years. And we can't have that. There must be that exemption. That is where we need to go. We need to continue the regulation with the Clean Water Act and account for the new and uh, contaminants like PFAS. But we also need to realize that there is an action going on that needs to be fixed. You can't keep treating wastewater entities like they're part of the problem. We're part of the solution. We want to help. We are the troops on the ground. Mr. Malinowski, our time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malinowski. Uh, Ms. Bordeaux, you recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman Napolitano and Ranking Member Rouser for holding today's hearing. As we get ready to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act next month, I appreciate having this forum to highlight the successes of this landmark piece of legislation, as well as discuss some areas of need for improvement. I'm grateful to all of our witnesses for joining us for this important conversation. 
Before I begin, I want to ask unanimous consent to submit a letter from the American River Association for the record. So ordered. Thank you, Chairwoman. My district is home to a number of organizations that are on the cutting edge of water technology, including the Water Tower and the Wayne Hill Water Resources Center. The Water Tower is a nonprofit organization committed to creating an ecosystem of water innovation, which brings together public and private sectors of the water industry, as well as academic and policy experts to tackle challenges the water industry faces. The work of these organizations and other public, private, and nonprofit institutions across this country would not be possible if it were not for the Clean Water Act. So my first question is for Mr. Esquivel. Um, and in your testimony, you mentioned the problem that California is having with harmful algal blooms, which I know is a concern for many members of this committee. Uh, we have similar concerns around Lake Lanier, which is in my district and provides 70% of the drinking water for the Atlanta metro area. I am pleased that a study on this issue was included in the House passed version of WERDA. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand on the impact HABs have and the process uh, to mitigate these issues. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. I really appreciate the question. Recently, the San Francisco Bay suffered a, a red tide, a harmful algal bloom, not to human health, but to certainly to fish, where we saw mass mortalities because of nutrient uh, inputs into, into our waterways, into our water bodies. Those uh, inputs come from wastewater treatment plants that although are, are treating now the secondary uh, standards uh, are, are effluent and in many cases, in some cases increasingly tertiary, meaning a higher level of, of removal of, of nutrients and other pollutants, uh, we're still uh, really challenged by harmful algal blooms. And with a warming climate, the, the heat uh, is making the, the ease inputs uh, all the more uh, challenging for us. We're actually setting drinking water standards currently, notification levels for some of the toxins in harmful algal blooms for our drinking water systems as a response. But we also have to get a control on the inputs themselves. And as been noted here in our discussion, non-point source pollution and our, our partners in agriculture and other industries, you know, stormwater um, uh, as well in cities are the sources. And they are uh, so much cheaper to clean up at the source than it is to have to then at the back end here, like so many of our challenges, invest and have fall upon our ratepayers these affordability issues. There, uh, the state is fortunate in that we have Porter Cologne, which allows us to actually regulate nitrate discharges in agriculture. It has been a slow uh, but important relationship and process here at the state these last decades to really begin to develop the science that helps us understand what is a, an acceptable level of, of nitrate application for our partners in agriculture. How do we ensure that we aren't uh, here uh, harming our ability to grow food and fiber, but instead improve our watersheds? And so this nexus between nutrient inputs um, and harmful algal blooms is going to become all the more important. And so too are these, these solutions that we have amongst us to measure, to manage, and to work with our, our partners across in agriculture to address these increasingly challenging issues. Thank you. And I just want to put a point on that, that we are seeing algal blooms in the drinking water of the Atlanta metro area and really do not yet have our arms around what is causing it. And how to prevent it and what a large strategy needs to be. And so I think emphasizing that as we go forward is gonna be very, very important. Uh, Mr. Witt, I appreciate your testimony's focus on water utility success stories. Gwinnett County's wastewater treatment facility, the Wayne Hill uh, Resource Center is an award-winning uh, advanced wastewater treatment facility. Uh, it cleans and returns to the environment some of the highest quality wastewater in the United States. I see I'm running out of time. Uh, but just wanted to talk with you briefly, what is currently the biggest hurdle you see in the creation of clean water infrastructure? It's funding, without a doubt. Um, there is, you know, treating wastewater is expensive. It's very energy intensive. Uh, it's very resource intensive. And, and as one of the other uh, witnesses brought up today, we are at the point now where we're losing our best people to those, I believe as Mr. Ross said, well-deserved retirements. But the brain drain is incredible. And if we don't have funding for educational programs and start, just start training people for these jobs, and again, you know, one out of every 300 Americans employed in the clean water sector, well-paying jobs, local jobs, getting the training for that 
Getting the money to build the infrastructure, getting the money to train the people to run that infrastructure are the two biggest hurdles. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Bordeaux. And next we have Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you very much. And I'd, I'd like to uh, offer my uh, opening remarks for the record so I can go right to the question. Uh, and Ms. Escobar, uh, as we have seen in Flint, Michigan and Jackson, Mississippi, poor and minority communities are hardest hit by a lack of investment in water infrastructure. And I'm pleased your organization made it a priority to address this situation uh, with the development of the racial equity plan. Can you go more in detail on why this was necessary and how successful it's been so far? Thank you so much, Congresswoman Johnson. You know, what, when we look at the challenges that we face here at the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act, the inequities that still exist um, are, are so very linked to uh, racial inequity. When we look at access to clean water and air, it means that it's really important that we as governments have a discussion around how we ensure that our programs are touching all of us, are ensuring that the benefit of access to clean water, both drinking water and sanitation, uh, are, are, are a common benefit. What we, call, what we say in California, you know, a, a human right to, to water and sanitation is, is, is pivotal and is actually part of our water code. So having a discussion with our communities to understand what are the barriers to access, how we as government institutions ensure that there is equity in access amongst our communities is so critical. And especially because unfortunately, we're inheritors of a, a history of explicit lack of extension of municipal services to so many of our communities based on race. And so it then is incumbent upon us here in this moment to best understand the context of those challenges, as difficult as it is, especially as governments to talk about race in a way that um, does credit to the complexity of, of this history that we are inheritors of. And it's not lost on me again that 50 years ago, these were fundamental uh, discussions that we were having as a nation, access to clean water, access to clean air, the livability of our communities, and how racial equity was something that we were going to be able to achieve. And we've, we've come, uh, we've made strides, certainly, uh, but there's still a long way to go. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Katz, what other tools can we give to the states and municipalities to help address uh, the clean drinking water? I know that someone said money, but uh, are there other tools? Yes, uh, there, there are options available under the Clean Water Act to address communities. Um, one of the things I think that um, is helpful uh, is the, the way that permitting is set up under the Clean Water Act. One of the tools that is available, um, the administrator or the delegated state authority, um, when they're issuing a permit or renewing a permit, they um, must consider the, the cumulative impacts in a sense because they have to look at the, the quality of the receiving water body and whether or not that's meeting water quality standards. So um, as permitting authorities are looking to identify um, you know, what limits should be allowed from a particular discharge of perhaps a new industrial facility, um, uh, they must consider you know, what, whether or not those water quality, the water quality of the receiving water body is meeting standards or not. Um, and then I would just echo, as others have talked about, the, the funding it and making it available in forms that um, are, can assist communities that, that are disadvantaged. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Lamofa, you're recognized. Mr. Lamofa, you're recognized. You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. Mr. Lamalfa, you are muted. There. Yeah, thank you. The button, the wrong button. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate the patience on that. Um, and uh, thank you for the hearing today. I'm sorry I'm bouncing between committees here today. So um, uh, I want to talk about some issues going on in the far northern California with the uh, the water challenges we have, uh, 
partly due to the um, actions taken by the Water Resources Control Board of California. And uh, some of the things that they need to know about with, uh, with what's basically water stealing. Now we have a gigantic problem with marijuana grows in uh, all over our state, but it's certainly, you know, you have in LA County, Riverside, San Bernardino, as well as uh, a lot of it in the Shasta, Siskiyou County, Shasta County, Butte and others. And the amount of water we're losing to, uh, to these grows illegally is very significant. So at the same time as the uh, water board is coming in and shutting down water to agriculture, on uh, the Shasta River Association, as their water diversions are beginning for a crop season, you know, to grow food for people. Uh, they had the farmers up there to plead to allow the use of the water for fire suppression and keeping their livestock they already have alive through watering. And so they face penalties of $500 per day for violating a curtailment, 10,000 per day for violating a cease and desist. And the board is requiring a minimum flow of 50 CFS through the uh, Shasta River. Yet, so the uh, the situation with the uh, un basically unregulated marijuana grows uh, doesn't seem to get that same attention. So the the state board's priorities seem to look like farmers have their water taken away, fire suppression probably won't get water from a nearby source. They'd have to fly the helicopters and aircraft and others much farther away to get water get water, but the fish are guaranteed water. And so we have the illegal grows, the water theft is basically being ignored. It's not being enforced. These grows are happening against county ordinance. They're happening against uh, the size that the state would uh, perhaps allow under legislation that passed. And they're certainly against federal law. So we've got a giant problem. So uh, it's been publicized several times in the LA Times, for example. So I'd like to actually submit for the record, Madam Chairman, uh, these articles from the LA Times talking about this very seriously on, on the marijuana grow problem around the state. So let me get no to order. the question. So th thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so Chairman Esquivel, why is the state spending its time, resources, and enforcing water diversions that have been going on for many decades in normal farming and amp ranching operations, uh, producing food and as well as drinking water sources that would, you would have for uh, the small towns up there. And instead, the, the needs of the cartels setting up illegal uh, water theft operations, growing illegal marijuana are allowed to thrive. We have multinational cartels up there getting away with this as farms go dry and even water for fire suppression is, uh, is uh, taken away. Thank you, Congressman. And I, you know, and appreciate and acknowledge that we're in a historic drought and incredible circumstances up and down our watersheds. You know, the state board itself currently is supporting over 2,200 households with hauled water throughout the state because of uh, declining groundwater levels. So managing our water resources in the middle of this drought is incredibly important. And if you look across the West, uh, curtailment is far more a regular function of actually administering water rights. And actually this last year was the first time in California's history that we are actively administering water rights because of water levels being so low. And I would note though that these curtailments largely protect senior water right holders in watersheds and is our uh, here rational way of managing through what is incredible scarcity. Um, I have to politely push back. It is not an either or. If you look at the, the uh, curtailment and enforcement work that the board is doing, they are all, we're also uh, following up on illegal diversions from cannabis and actually have here years of working with locals to try to best uh, bring, bring the, the um, folks that are, are, are coming into the legal space legally and making sure that we're um, enforcing uh, against illegal growth and importantly, illegal diversions, whether it's cannabis or other diverters in a watershed in the middle of this incredible drought. So I, I welcome your interest in this. I would be glad to follow up, continue, continue to follow up and explain the enforcement actions the board is taking against illegal cannabis as one aspect of what is a, a, a multi-pronged drought response that is, includes putting our communities in the center of, of that response and ensuring we have access to clean water. 
as well as curtailing and as well as ensuring that the quality of our waters are protected. Well, I appreciate that, but uh, er everything I represent is north of Sacramento, so I can't speak to how much the board might be enforcing in you know, Southern California, but we're not seeing it in the north. Uh, we have, a, we have, I have specific uh, numbers. I can pull them up and, and share them certainly with you of dozens of inspections and current violations that we're pursuing. Um, I have to be careful. I'm actually firewalled from a lot of that enforcement work because I, I, I have my role here is ultimately as a judge, if there is any disputes amongst that enforcement work. But I know, and we have statistics around specifically in the Scott and the Shasta and up in, in the Siskiyou County, the enforcement work that we've been doing. Mr. Well, there's a lot of enforcement on farming and ranching, but we need it for on the marijuana side. The marijuana been is both. running rampant with cartels. Mr. LaMalfa, your time has expired. Okay, I, I look forward to that information from uh, Mr. Esquivel. Thank you. Thank you, That's sir. Follow up. Thank you. We are now recognizing Ms. Norton. Ms. Norton, you may proceed. I want to thank you, uh, uh, Chair Napolitano, for holding this important hearing and Chair DeFazio for including my provisions, authorizing studies of swimming in the Potomac and Anacostia rivers, and of a second drinking water source and increased storage capacity in the House Pass Water Resources Development Act, and I hope these provisions will be included in the final bill. Um, Mr. Esquivel, it is well established that racial discrimination is pervasive in access to clean water resources. Communities of color are the most likely to be impacted by water pollution and denied access to clean, safe drinking water. Could you explain more what, uh, uh, what factors are being taken into account as the California State Water Board develops its racial equality plan and are these factors and are there factors that other districts may consider when working to combat racial discrimination in clean water access? Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for the question. And I, I think I'll start by saying, you know, so much of our work, the most important part is actually seeing communities. Um, there on the drinking water side, the state, at the state water, at the leadership of the state water board, but importantly, with communities, with water agencies, with Californians, developed a drinking water needs assessment where we looked at the technical, managerial, financial capacity of systems, their violations. You know, we at the state water board actually regulate nearly 3,000 water systems in the state of California. And altogether, we have somewhere, and those are community water systems, we have 7,000 public water systems. And those vary from Los Angeles to San Francisco, very well-resourced, large agencies, sophisticated agencies to those that are serving below 500 connections, smaller agencies, part-time boards, and a real challenge with access to clean water. And that nexus between uh, racial equity and race and access to water, but importantly, the data to actually see communities, not wait for systems to fail, not wait for the challenge to be brought to, to a solution to be brought to us from communities, that are struggling to, to provide other basic services that we know are disadvantaged in so many ways. It's unfair for the state to sit back and say, the, the, the challenge is on you. And instead, so much of the work that we've done is about lifting up that lived experience through data and making sure then by having that data, we can funnel funding, we can funnel discussions and consolidate systems uh, across, uh, across regions, which is really the long-term solution for so many of us. But that requires so much discussion and importantly putting people first that it's been the resources of that governor newsom has provided the board that has really made the difference to see communities to be part of discussions and to lift up the lived challenges and experiences that so many of our communities have suffered under for decades so that's you know i'll say that's been so much of the important work as we pursue it is really on that data side uh, thank you for that response uh, miss gatz bodies of water in the district of columbia are affected by urban runoff and non points and uh, a non point source pollution. Since the Clean Water Act does not authorize the regulation of non point sources, what can be done to increase regulation of these sources? Is a CWA amendment the best option or what is? Well, of course, um, Congresswoman, uh, CRS doesn't take 
positions on um, the best option, but I can provide you with some options that are available to Congress in addressing this. Um, some um, pro, you know, proponents will argue that regulation of non-point sources is something that should be pursued, um, and that there's a disproportionate um, amount of pressure on point sources to reduce discharges. But others will argue that um, they observers believe that the best approach is to continue collaborative stakeholder-based approaches that try to um, utilize financial assistance from the federal government, from Congress, um, through grants, technical assistance, and other means to address um, non-point source pollution. So in those cases, an option for Congress would be to continue to, to support the types of programs that help manage non-point source pollution, like the Clean Water Act Section 319 program, um, and, and other, you know, some of the areas around the nation, some of the geographic programs, the National Estuary Program can also su help support such efforts. And even um, the Clean Water SRF, which we've talked a lot about today, also does have eligibility for those types of projects as well. Thank you very much. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Uh, Mr. Uh, Carvajal, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. Uh, before I came to Congress, I served in local government as a county supervisor in Santa Barbara County. And I'm very familiar with the role of the State Water Resource uh, Control Board and the balancing role that it has in trying to uh, address the regulatory framework of all these water systems and yet uh, try to do it in a balanced way that collaborates with those uh, being regulated. And it's, it's always a challenge, uh, never easy. Mr. Esquivel, uh, I really appreciate your leadership and the role uh, that you played in making the State Board work collaboratively with stakeholders. On October 18, 1972, Congress took a historic step when it enacted the Clean Water Act into law. For the past 50 years, this landmark legislation has been responsible for protecting one of our nation's most precious and finite resources from pollution, our waterways, including our oceans, lakes, and rivers. Mr. Esquivel, as California continues to deal with the prolonged drought conditions, can you discuss how the state is dealing with this challenge? Thank you, Congressman. It's multi-pronged. Uh, we have communities that are running out of water because of drought. We have a need to administer water rights to ensure that we're not dra draining our watersheds to the last drop uh, and here managing through what may very well be another dry year because of a La Nina. So the actions that the state are taking are, are ones of immediate response, certainly, making sure that our communities are supported, uh, that uh, we don't have communities running out of hauled water, including those on domestic wells, setting up programs with our county partners, which are such, such a critical key part of responding to the drought, but then also thinking about the long-term, um, how we make investments in, in our, our, the next century's worth of infrastructure, including water recycling, stormwater capture, and groundwater recharge. You know, Governor Newsom, uh, under his leadership, we just developed a, a water supply strategy that is trying to really quantify what is this aridification, this hotter, drier state, that we're gonna to have to continue to adapt to. And where do we need to continue to conserve? And how do we also uh, here grow our water portfolio? And it's gonna take really, and it's been noted here, focusing on workforce development, focusing on bringing in the best and brightest minds to the challenges we're facing. And drought is one aspect of it, but it's also a future flood. It's also really being specific and in, in here, adapting our water systems to this new 21st century climate that we know we have. So uh, it's been on the immediate, it's been about responding to communities and, and the growing complexity there, but also about funding and shaping the policies that will help guide us to this next generation of projects, including direct potable reuse. Thank you. The bipartisan infrastructure law, which my colleagues and I helped draft, made available billions of dollars in supplemental funding for the Department of the Interior and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to address drought, wildfire, and ecosystem restoration needs. Specifically, we provided the Department of the Interior with over $8 billion to help Western states like California. Can you delve into how the bipartisan infrastructure law has helped California continue to lead and comply with the Clean Water Act? Mr. Esquivel? 
Thank you again, Congressman. I, I think it, as was noted, you dial back 50 years ago and so much of the progress that we've had was because of the investments we made to actually achieve the water quality standards we were looking for from our, our, our clean water sector, our wastewater treatment plants and other folks in the industry. And, and as we you know, look forward now, the bipartisan infrastructure law is a good down payment for what is the need of a new generational reinvestment because of aging infrastructure, because of the pressures we know and have spoken of on climate change and, and the inequities we see, it's gonna, it's gonna take resources. And it, it, regrettably, as we think of affordability, as we ensure that uh, we can have sustainable systems into the future, that federal investment, that backbone investment is so critical. And you see other sectors, transportation, energy, uh, things that are so fundamental to our economies uh, be funded at the federal level to help subsidize the pressures in our communities. And we saw a regression of that on the, on the clean water side, on the water, drinking water side from those historic investments in the 70s. Now is the time to, to and, and what the bipartisan infra infrastructure law has done is energized so many of the discussions because with the resources to actually invest, it's bringing people to the table, it's bringing communities and, and other uh, interested parties to, to figure out how we uh, accomplish this huge goal. Thank you. Uh, with the limited time, uh, Ms. Sosi, thank you for your testimony You're today. Right. Since I'm the last one, may I have 30 extra seconds, Madam Chair? You may. Thank you very much. Ms. Sosi, thank you for your testimony today. Can you discuss what are the biggest challenges tribes face in providing clean water to their communities? Thank you, Representative. Uh, there are several challenges. I am happy to get you and your office a list given the a limited amount of time, but funding, infrastructure, and regulation are, are some of the biggest ones that, that I've noticed in my capacity. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Carvajal. Ms. Gonzalez Colon, do you wish to speak? Yes, ma'am. You're recognized. Thank you, ma'am. Um, uh, Mr. Ross, uh, as many of us here today uh, know, Puerto Rico is still in the midst of responding uh, to Hurricane Fiona, which has dropped more than 20 inches of rain in part of the island, and it has, and it has continued to rain. And as, as yesterday, more than seven, uh, 700,000 customers of Puerto Rico, Aqueduct and Sewer Authority, PRASA as we call it, are without drinking water service after the island was hit. Rivers are still overrunning uh, their banks and more than 100, 112 filtration plants across the Puerto Rico are not operating due to flooding. On top of the water issues is that electricity across the island is again uh, down for the vast majority of the people and services such as water treatment facilities um, among others. So my question uh, for you and the rest of the panel is this, what resources are available under the Clean Water Act in these emergency situations uh, to ensure that my constituents will have safe drinking water available in, most of, uh, in the most efficient manner while response uh, and, uh, and eventually recovery uh, recovery are, are going. Yeah, <clears throat> Representative, thank you so much for the question and, and our heartbreaks uh, for what's happening down there in Puerto Rico right now. I know we spent so much time, EPA spent a lot of time working to, to, to help the, the island Puerto Rico recover from some of the last significant blows. Um, I would look at it in twofold. I think there is significant funding on the Clean Water Act, um, both in some of the grant programs and long-term financing and flexible financing including the new enhancements that have come out in the, in the most recent round of legislation. But in the short term, I'd also take a look at FEMA. Um, there's a very, very significant pool of funding, both in emergency response, but also in proactive future um, resilient building. And that was a fairly significant over the last five or six years modification to the FEMA funding opportunity. And so I'd really encourage um, Puerto Rico to spend a lot of time looking at that resiliency funding under FEMA, in addition to the Clean Water Act, Drinking Water Act portfolio. And we're still managing on that, and right now we're working with FEMA to have generators uh, to actually put up and running those those water plants. Uh, but we we may not be able to have generators to all power to all uh, treatment plants on the island as uh, soon as we want. So 
how how can how, how can the Clean Water Act be best utilized uh, post hurricane recovery to mitigate against future losses and, and develop you know green infrastructure uh, to help deal with excess of waters, right? You know, um, Mr. Ross, can you help me with that? Yeah, I, I do think um, you know there is flexibility under under the existing authorities in in the state revolving funds, particularly even with the loan forgiveness. Um, and I think that's particularly important down in Puerto Rico to be funding the green infrastructure and to be looking at at stormwater capture not only as protecting public health but as also new sources of water, right? And I think that is one of the transitions the water sector is going through right now is looking more holistically at um, rather than stormwater uh, being an emergency thing that we had to grapple around, it's also finding a way to use a green infrastructure to both build more protective, resilient communities and also look at capturing it for sources of water going forward, whether or not it's in the short-term emergency response or long-term viability of the, of, of the island operations. Thank you. And again, if, if anyone else on the panel would like to add anything, I, I just will welcome the input. Uh, Mr. Ross, if Congress move a disaster supplemental for those affected by Hurricane Fiona, in your experience, what should be included included there to better mitigate against future disasters? Well, I, I really think, you know, looking at that resilient, um, I think it's a, a set aside out of every annual appropriation for FEMA for the emergency response, they can set aside five or 6% of the appropriation for future resiliency building. I think that is really innovative and it, it's a way to be thinking about, you know, how can we build a resilient infrastructure so we're not recovering? Um, I do think we also need to be looking at, um, and, I, and I saw this even when we were there, you know, the speed at which the federal government can respond, you know, the administrative state is difficult to operate in and trying to find a way with a single lead to get all the agencies on the same page. So I think that interagency coordination needs work in the future to be more responsive. Thank you. And for the panel, uh, how can the implementation of that green infrastructure in watersheds help protect water treatment facilities and critical water infrastructure during and post network disasters such as Hurricane Fiona? Anyone in the panel? Congresswoman, I'll answer that question and thank you for posing it. I think one of the issues is that it's what you can build back with the FEMA funds. And I totally agree with Mr. Ross that FEMA is certainly where Puerto Rico should be looking right now. And uh, that is the best source for help. But it's what you can build back with FEMA funds. And unfortunately, uh, PVSC in New Jersey has a lot of experience with this as PVSC was completely wiped out in Superstorm Sandy uh, a decade ago. And so we are currently in the process of still rebuilding our facility from that devastation. But in order for the funds to be really useful, what you need to be able to do is not only build back what you had and then protect that, but maybe build something better to begin with when you're building back, as opposed to just what you had. And removing restrictions on what you can and can't build going forward with using those FEMA funds may be a better way to go about it. Thank you, my time expired, so uh, I wanna thank all the members of the panel. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Madam. Uh, I uh, uh, listen with great intent, uh, but we want to make sure that Native Americans and the communities of colors have more uh, focus uh, from, uh, especially the Army Corps and the EPA, as Ms. Norton uh, indicated. Uh, it's time that they got uh, recognition that they have been overlooked. And uh, we certainly want to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act next month. And I think we have learned a lot from the highlights and lessons learned from the witnesses. And uh, I thank them very much for their input. It's a good hearing, but I also want to thank our post staff for putting it together for us. And uh, I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such a time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. I, and I also ask for unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by the members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I also would like to thank our witnesses again for your valuable testimony today. It's very uh, insightful and enlightening. And if no other members have anything to add, the committee stands adjourned.